Let's study 10th standard ICSC chemistry chapter 6 metallurgy. Metallurgy is related to the extraction of metals and minerals. Let's first understand the difference between a metal and a non-metal. Metals are electron donors because they have one, two or three valence electrons which they can easily lose to become cations. So they always form electrovalent compounds with other non-metals. Non-metals having four, five, six, seven valence electrons usually, they easily gain electrons. They are electronegative. They form anions and they can form electrovalent compounds with other metals or they can form covalent compounds with other non-metals or with themselves by sharing electrons. Metals have positive valency and non-metals have negative valencies. There are some differences in their physical properties as well, which you may have studied in lower standards. But now we'll focus on their uh, chemical properties, how they are different. Metals are reducing agents because they can easily lose electrons. And non-metals are good oxidizing agents because they can easily gain electrons. Metallic oxides are basic oxides. That is, uh, they can react with an acid to neutralize them. Some of them can dissolve in water as well to give hydroxyl ions. Those are called alkalis. There are a few oxides which sometimes behave like acids as well. So they are called amphoteric oxides. You just have to remember three of them. Aluminium oxide, lead oxide and zinc oxide. Zinc oxide, yellow when hot and white when cold. Lead oxide, buff yellow when hot and yellow when cold. Aluminium oxide, white when hot when white when cold. That's just some observation you will require in some future chapters. Non-metallic oxides are usually acidic because they dissolve in water to form respective acids, which can be a strong acid or a weak acid. But there are a few non-metallic oxides which are neutral, like these. Carbon monoxide, nitrogen monoxide, dinitrogen oxide and dihydrogen oxide, which is water. Now let's understand the difference between minerals and ores. Minerals are any compound of uh, a metal found in nature and of course it's not pure metal, there are some earthly impurities in them, them as well. So they are precious. And minerals are found everywhere. You take a handful of soil, it will have some minerals. But that doesn't mean we can start mining for the metal anywhere because the percentage of the metal should be quite high in an area for it to be profitable enough to try to extract it. You see, mining is an expensive process. It should be worth it. So after analysis of the Earth's crust at various places, scientists come to a conclusion if there is an ore out there. So ore is the naturally occurring minerals. Okay, ore, uh, ores are minerals from which metals can be extracted profitably and conveniently. There is gold in soil, near your house as well but it is such in such low concentration that if you try to extract it and purify it and remove all the impurities you'll realize it's not worth it it's just too expensive a process now there are some common ores that we have to learn of aluminium bauxite cryolite and corundum bauxite is a main ore its uh, chemical name is hydrated aluminium oxide formula has to be learned cryolite formula sodium aluminium fluoride and corundum is not hydrated, it's just aluminium oxide. But it is not as abundant as bauxite. Now there are four steps involved in the extraction of metals. Step one, dressing of the ore, it's all set to enter the factories or the laboratories to be purified. Of course it has to look its best, so we'll dress it up. Actually, it's just concentration of the ore. We have to remove the gang, that is the impurities, as much as possible by a simple process. Let's study four of them. Hydrolytic method or gravity separation, magnetic separation, froth flotation method and chemical method. We need not study this in detail because the syllabus has been reduced for this year. But we have extraction of aluminium in our syllabus, so we need to know that the chemical method is the one we are going to use to concentrate the bauxite ore for extraction of aluminium. And that method is called Bayer's process, where you will be using the sodium hydroxide chemical. The second step is conversion of 
concentrated ore that we just concentrated into its oxide. For example, if you have zinc sulfide, then first let's convert it to zinc oxide because it is easy to extract zinc from its oxide. Or if it's zinc carbonate, let's first convert it to zinc oxide. Then we can break this bond and remove the zinc. If we directly try to remove zinc from here or from here, it's a far more difficult process. Anyway, now in the extraction of aluminium, this step is not relevant because bauxite is aluminium oxide after all. So it is already in the oxide form. So we'll jump directly to step three now. That is reduction of metallic oxides to its metal. By reduction, we mean removal of the oxygen. From aluminium oxide, I want to get rid of the oxygen so that I can get pure aluminium. Now notice that aluminium belongs to the top five most reactive metals. So their oxides are so stable. They have such high affinity for oxygen that they cannot be extracted or reduced by using a reducing agent or just by thermal decomposition, which is the case for these elements here. Here, you just heat mercury oxide, you get pure mercury. Or if you have zinc oxide heated with carbon or other reducing agent, you get pure zinc. But they won't work here. The only method to reduce aluminium oxide to aluminium is by electrolysis. That's what we're going to study in detail now. Note that in these cases, the metal obtained is not very pure. So we'll have to do a fourth step called electro refining, which we have studied in the previous chapter. Again, electrolysis is used to refine it to get pure metal at the cathode. But in extraction of aluminium, we can skip this method because we are using electrolysis for reduction itself. So the aluminium will obtain at the cathode is anyway 99% pure. So we need not do electro refining. And this electrolysis method for extraction of aluminium is called hall herolds process. So this year, page 132, 133, 134 and 135 are cancelled. In fact, even 131 is uh, ca cancelled. You need not learn this at all. But the general knowledge will help you to understand this extraction of aluminium. So let's start with that. Ores of aluminium, we've already studied this. Aluminium is the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust. Metal, okay, not element. Which element is the most abundant in the Earth's crust? Well, find out and let me know. This process revolutionized the world when it was uh, discovered by Bayer's and Hall Herald's. Aluminium is used in so many fields, from making aeroplanes to the tin, the aluminium coils, uh, aluminium cans, aluminium foils, aluminium wires, aluminium window panes. So step number one, dressing of the ore, that is we want to concentrate it. So what's the problem? Well, this alumina, this, this bauxite, that is hydrated aluminium oxide, has this water of crystallization. I want to get rid of it. That seems to be easy. But the fact is that there are some other impurities also, like sand. Sand is nothing but silicon dioxide. It also has a ferric oxide, iron 3 oxide. So I want to get rid of these. But the nice thing about aluminum oxide is it's amphoteric. So if I react it with a conch solution of sodium hydroxide, caustic soda, at a high temperature, it will dissolve in it. It will react with it to form salt and water. It's a neutralization reaction happening. On the other hand, the other impurities like iron oxide and silicon dioxide, they won't react with sodium hydroxide. They will remain undissolved. They can be filtered out and separated. So what is left is a solution of sodium aluminate. So I got rid of the impurities. Nice. But I still haven't got my aluminum oxide back. So the next step is I'm going to heat the solution at a moderate temperature, warm environment of 50 60 degrees celsius so i'll get my sodium hydroxide back which i had used earlier but now i will get a precipitate of aluminium hydroxide that's cool because now i can filter it again and separate it from sodium hydroxide and to hasten this process of precipitation you can add a few crystals of aluminium hydroxide already in the solution looking at the crystals of aluminium hydroxide other molecules will be motivated and they will also form aluminium hydroxide precipitate. This addition of a few crystals of aluminium hydroxide in it is called seeding. This aluminium hydroxide is then heated at a high temperature so that it decomposes to form alumina, pure alumina and the water vapor evaporates. So starting from bauxite, now we have pure alumina, we have got rid of the water of crystallization and we have got rid of the impurities, silicon dioxide and ferric oxide and even the sodium hydroxide we had used earlier is now separated. So we've got pure alumina. 
So now the next step is to break the bond between aluminum and oxygen, which is quite difficult because aluminum has a great affinity for oxygen. So this is the electrolysis device we are going to use. We have the electrolyte here. The cathode is in fact the walls of this container. That's right. It is made up of a carbon lining, which will serve as a cathode. You can see it is connected to the negative terminal of the battery. And these rods, these electrodes are the anode, all connected to the positive terminal. Even these rods are made up of graphite or carbon rods. You can see on top of the electrolyte, we have some powdered coke, which has some function. So what happens is, as expected, the aluminum ions, the cations will be attracted towards the cathode and will be converted into aluminum metal, which being heavier will settle at the bottom. And we can remove it with this tap, molten aluminum. And we can keep on refilling the electrolyte. And what about the oxygen? Well, the oxygen will be released at the anode and the oxygen gas will be given out. That's the basic process. But uh, it's a bit more complex than that. First of all, the electrolyte used is not just aluminum oxide. We have to add a few more things. We have to add three parts of cryolite and one part of fluor spar as well. Remember the ratio. This is the entire electrolyte used. Why? What is the function of this cryolite and fluor spar? I'll come to that soon. Electrodes, as I said, cathode and anode, and the temperature is 950 degrees Celsius. So only then the electrolyte will be in molten state. Current, 100 amperes. That's a lot of current. That's 67 volts. These are the various ionization reactions taking place, ionization and dissociation. I see that cryolite is giving us three different ions. Fluor spar will give us two ions and alumina will give us two ions, but aluminum, aluminum ions are same here. So totally, I would say one, two, three, four, five ions are formed. Three cations and two anions. So one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, again, fluorine, fluorine. So out of these two, these three cations, which one will be discharged at the cathode? Aluminium. If you look at the electrochemical series, you will see aluminium is much below compared to sodium and calcium. And out of the two anions, which one will be discharged at the anode? Well, oxygen will be. So the cathode and anode reactions should be studied. Aluminium will give you pure metal at the cathode. And at the anode, you see oxygen molecules are produced. Make sure you learn the balanced reactions here. Here, three nascent oxygen atoms. The brackets mean they are nascent. That is, they are monoatomic. They are highly unstable, very reactive. They cannot live like this. They cannot exist like this. They will have to react with three more uh, such atoms from the next batch of reactions to form molecules. And this oxygen gas is released at the anode. By the way, the observation at the anode is not oxygen gas. In fact, oxygen will react with these carbon rods to form carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So you will see the anode is getting corroded with time. It, it diminishes in size. And that is why these anodes have to be replaced frequently. So now a few questions. Why is there a powdered coke on top? And why do we have these additional compounds in the electrolyte? These are all very important give reasons. First of all, if we had used only molten alumina as an electrolyte, that would have some problems associated with it because fused alumina is almost a non-electrolyte. It hardly provides any ions. Its resistance is quite high. And its melting point is around 2050 degrees Celsius. It's so high to maintain, to be maintained. And at such a high temperature, a lot of electrical energy will be required. Also, the aluminium produced, um, some of it might just evaporate at such a high temperature. So we need to add something to reduce the melting point of the electrolyte. And to the rescue comes fused cryolite and fluor spar because when they are added, the melting point drops to just 950 degrees Celsius. So it is, it's easier to maintain this temperature. Remember the ratios in which they are added. Uh, there is another advantage by adding cryolite and fluor spar. It enhances the mobility of the fused mixture. The ions move more freely in the electrolyte. And of course, the cryolite easily dissolves all the aluminum oxide in it. Why is a layer of powdered coke sprinkled? Because at such a high temperature, it's possible that the heat is given out as radiation, which will cause this exposed part of the electrode, it is exposed to the air, it will catch fire, it will start burning. So to block it, 
uh, we have powdered coke which will absorb a lot of heat it's a bad conductor here uh, it, it, it won't allow the heat to pass on to the outer part of the electrode and the process of uh, refilling the electrolyte is a continuous process so as aluminium is being extracted the concentration of aluminium in the electrolyte will decrease a time will come when the charge control lamp will glow indicating that the time has come to pour in more of alumina in it now let's talk about alloys alloy is a substance prepared by adding other metals or non metals to a base metal in appropriate proportion to obtain certain desirable properties so for example in brass copper and zinc are molten and fused together to form a homogeneous mixture called alloy which is then solidified and it has properties intermediate to both it has copper's properties as well as zinc's properties so it has the best of both the worlds remember if one of the ingredients is mercury we call it an amalgam that's a special type of an alloy the alloys we have in our syllabus are brass so remember the constituents in proper order even though you don't have to remember the percentages you need to know the constituents in the correct order that is decreasing order so if they ask you the constituents of bronze it will be copper comma tin and then write zinc because zinc is in a very less proportion now how will you remember this well brass has an s that means it does not have stannum it has zinc and bronze has a z that means it hardly has zinc it has stannum we need to study the properties of the alloys and what are their uses so a good reason can be asked why is bronze used to make metals so because they are hard and they take a polish they can shine that is why aluminum alloys we just have one duralumin which has aluminum plus copper plus magnesium and manganese four constituents the aluminum imparts lightness to it that is why it can be used to make aircraft the lighter it is the less fuel will be used magnesium is added to impart strength to it it's important while making all these equipments like cooker light tools etc lead alloys well solder is quite uh, popular we are familiar with it in physics we have studied that an alloy of lead and tin is used as a fuse metal to make a fuse because by adding tin to lead we are lowering the melting point it's just 180 degrees celsius so if excess current passes through it it will melt and it will break the circuit it is also used for soldering purposes that is uh, when you want to join two metal wires together with the help of some heat it's similar to welding iron alloys we just have to study stainless steel as the name suggests there are no stains it is uh, rust free it is made up of iron it has chromium and nickel as well as carbon although in very small quantity it's a non metal by the way in this alloy the nickel and the chromium impart luster it shines it can be used as a mirror and the carbon imparts hardness and makes it corrosion resistant it is used for making utensils cutlery autos and surgical instruments as well hi students this is aj sir if you like this video press the like button if you would like to enroll for my online test series or online lectures email me or message me on instagram check the description for more information